minute so that that can start. So welcome everybody to uh, the first um, expert panel of the day. Uh, this panel is focused on practitioner-oriented uh, research. And we have three wonderful panelists joining us um, today. Uh, incidentally, I should mention that these are uh, they, each of them represent three of the organizations that the Center uh, for International Higher Education works more, most closely with. And you will understand uh, what I mean by that in just a moment. Uh, so first of all, we're very happy to welcome Bryce Liu, who is Associate Director of Research at WES. As you know, this uh, entire Summer Institute, Institute is brought together by WES and uh, CIHE. So welcome, uh, Bryce. We also have Dr. Magdalena Bustos uh, Aguirre, who is a faculty member and also the coordinator of the master's program in international higher education at the Universidad de Guadalajara in Mexico. And as you know, this is our sibling program uh, and we're very happy to have Magda uh, representing um, that partnership uh, today. And also we have Giorgio Marinoni with us who is manager of higher education and internationalization at the International Association of Universities. Uh, and as you probably know, if you follow any of our events and research projects, you will know by now that we work very closely with IAU as well. So I'm really delighted to welcome you all to, um, to this session. Uh, we will begin with opening remarks by each of the three panelists. And uh, immediately after that, we will open it up for questions from all of you, as you know, you just need to type the questions. And also, you don't need to be uh, waiting until the end. You can ask your questions when you think of them. And we will be monitoring um, the, the Q&A. We will be monitoring the chat uh, here as well as through the uh, live uh, broadcast. So uh, please uh, joining me in welcoming Bryce Lu. Thanks, Gerardo. Um, good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, for me, it's early morning. And I just apologize in advance, I have a little bit of a cough this morning. Um, but as Gerardo said, my name is Bryce Liu. I'm the Associate Director of Research with World Education Services, or WES. We're one of the co-hosts of this particular event. So I'm happy to join you today. Um, I just wanted to take my remarks and I'll try to keep them very brief and just talk a little bit about my uh, professional background, um, just a little bit about Wes and a little bit about some, some of the research that we do. Um, I hold a master's in international education development from Teachers College, Columbia University. And I got into, um, or I should step back and say that um, my particular area of focus is in higher education policy and planning. And I, I particularly started looking and doing research heavily in student mobility during that time, I got into this program after spending two years <clears throat> in the U.S. Peace Corps, which is a, um, a U.S. government uh, funded uh, volunteer agency that sends uh, mostly young volunteers all around the world to do a, very, a variety of things. And I spent two years um, as an English teacher trainer in Mongolia, working for a teacher's college uh, west of the national capital. And uh, through that, I got I, that's what really sparked my interest in working in international education, particularly at the higher education level. So I focused on that going into graduate school. And while I was a graduate student, I started doing, uh, started doing a lot of research, both with um, faculty members and then for a couple of different organizations, probably most chiefly with um, the Institute of International Education or IIE working on what's known as the Open Doors Report, which is a big annual report that IIE does uh, that's funded in part by the US State Department that tracks the numbers of international students coming into the US, as well as US students who go study abroad. So it really takes um, a full look at, at kind of the numbers. And it's one of the biggest things that's cited in terms of student mobility numbers going into and out of the US. And from that, immediately after I finished, um, 
my graduate program, I, I got my job with West and I've been with West for about six and a half years. I started off as an intern and I've just kind of progressed my way up through the organization. And it's, it's been a great organization for me to work with. Um, Wes, just a little bit about Wes itself. We are um, based in the US and Canada. Our, our offices are in New York and Toronto, though obviously the last year and a half or so we haven't been in the office, but uh, we're kind of scattered all around the US and Canada. We are a nonprofit social enterprise, and a social enterprise is an organization that has a, a very specific social mission. Our organization has a way that we wish to kind of make an impact on the world, but we are financially self-sustaining. We have our own uh, revenue stream um, through our credential evaluation services, which I'll talk about in a second. And uh, as a result, we, we don't rely on donations, grants, anything like that. We have purely our own revenue stream that comes in that funds our, our social mission activities. Um, and, we, and a social mission also kind of makes use of a lot of uh, business practices to, to really advance that social mission. Um, the, the mission of our organization really is to help anyone who is educated outside of the US and Canada um, make use of that education as well as their experience and skills within, within the US and Canada. So we, we um, do that primarily through credential evaluation services. A credential evaluation is, um, is an assessment of somebody's uh, qualifications from another country. Uh, where we're able to authenticate it, say this is an authenticated document, a verifiable document, um, and we're able to then um, say here's the equivalency of that this particular qualification in a U.S. or a Canadian context, and that individual then can use it for a variety of purposes in either country. In the U.S., it's predominantly international students, so it's predominantly used for admission to college or university. Um, in Canada, it's predominantly for immigrants. Um, Canada has a really robust skilled immigration program, the biggest one of which is known as Express Entry. And we are one of the main providers for the Canadian federal government who, and as part of the Express Entry process, as well as through a couple of other immigration programs to Canada, individuals are required to have their credentials assessed um, as part of that program. It's a points-based system. Um, it's also used for things such as license, licensure certification in certain fields, engineering, medical fields, that type of thing, as well as for employment. Um, but in addition to that, our social mission activities include um, the Global Talent Bridge, which um, works with immigrant serving organizations, refugee serving organizations to help those individuals who are highly skilled become integrated into the US and Canada. We even have our own philanthropic fund um, uh, known as the West Maria Masefa Fund, where we provide grants out to organizations working with, with refugees, uh, immigrants, and international students. And then we also provide a lot of resources, particularly to those working in higher education, as well as immigrant serving organizations in the US and Canada. Um, in terms of the research that we do, um, it, it's really changed a lot over time when I first started our main focus was in inter, what's known as international enrollment management, which is really the recruitment and admission of international students, um, specifically in our case into US colleges and universities, but it's really diversified over time as the organization's needs have, have really grown and changed. Um, and really our work now is kind of, it's kind of all over. Um, there's really four streams of it. One is kind of business needs, which is kind of a newer thing for us. So, uh, a lot more work um, just on what are the business needs of the, of the organization, which is less what I work in. Um, I tend to work in the other three streams, which are um, social impact research. So really assessing what is Wes's social impact in the areas where it works. So specifically in immigration uh, and international higher education as well as external research that's meant to help the field grow. Um, particularly, we focus on um, international higher education in the US and specifically in the area of student mobility. So we've done a lot of work on international student experience in the US. <clears throat> we have, um, we're able to survey and gain access through our, our credential evaluation application pool. Um, we've done work on kind of the career outcomes of international students, as well as the career services that universities and colleges in the US provide to international students. Um, another area where I've done a lot of work is Wes's work with refugees. Um, we, 
In 2015, when the refugee crisis was hitting Europe, kind of in, in tandem with the Syrian crisis, um, we, as well as um, there were, there was an election uh, in Canada that brought in a new government that said, we want to resettle in tens of thousands of Syrian refugees. Um, we began doing a lot of research on how can we help in that. And um, we specifically looked at credential evaluation for refugees who lose access to a lot of the documents they have, or they we can't access the university for them to send over the documents. So, so how can we help these particular individuals? And we put together um, some best practices from around the world, particularly from Europe and North America, about how to kind of reconstruct somebody's educational background based on partial documents, copies of things, and so forth. And that really um, initiated that initiated a pilot project in Canada with Syrian refugees, and that scaled up to eventually to a program we have now known as the West Gateway Program, where we're able to provide credential evaluation services, often for free, to to refugees who don't have access to their full documents. So that's just a little bit of a sample of some of the work we've done. I'm happy to talk more about that as we go along. But at, at this point, I think I will turn it back over to um, Gerardo. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bryce, uh, for that uh, overview. And now we're going to turn it over uh, to Magda Bustos. Uh, so uh, please, uh, Magda. Thank you, Gerardo. Um, well, um, nice meeting you all. I, I was um, fortunate enough to have time to be in the session yesterday's uh, panel in the morning, and I and I thought it was a very very interesting discussion, um, particularly particularly relevant for those of us who are not in the global north, from those of us who try to do research and work in the internationalization field in the Global South. So a little bit about me. Um, I started in this um, world of international education very early uh, in my life. I was a high school um, exchange student. I spent a year in, in Olathe in a little town of 300 people in, in Colorado when I was a high school student. So that really spiked my interest in, in um, understanding a different culture, living, living abroad and student mobility in general. So th that really marked my career, my, my, um, my life in general. It's, uh, so it's not, um, I'm, I can say I'm a product of international education in that sense. So after that, I started working in the internationalization office of a private university. Like 10 years after I, I returned from my, my mobility experience and uh, as a high school student in a private university here in, in, in Guadalajara, where I'm based. And um, a few years later, I moved to the University of Guadalajara. It's a, it's a public, um, big university in the Western um, side of the country. And I moved in to work at the international office per se. I, I, among my responsibilities were handling all the mobility programs for the university. It's a huge university with more than 200,000 students. So it's it's major um, in terms of uh, numbers. Um, and uh, in 2013, I decided to start a, a PhD um, because I found out a program that had a, a research line on internationalization, which was quite new uh, for us in, in um, Mexico and, um, and, and the University of Guadalajara. It's, it's uh, actually the only program that has a specific research line on internationalization. It's a, a PhD, well, a, a doctoral degree in higher education management. Um, I finished in 2017 and at the same time, because of my, my experience in, in international education, my, my practitioner experience, I was um, invited to, to this uh, dual degree project where, where it was, um, you know, in the, in the, um, in the basis, it was, it was forming back in 2017. And I started working on the project and um, developed the program. And I was um, asked to coordinate it once it was approved and, you know, all the, all the bureaucratic process which in the public universities in Mexico, it's big as, as um, some of you might know. And, um, and since then I've been the coordinator of the program and I've been very, very lucky to see the program 
start and grow and um, um, tutor and mentor some of the students. So, so it's, it's been a, a very, very nice um, ride. Um, and in terms of that, I, I keep working with uh, doing research. I'm a faculty member of the university now. I started as an administrative in, back in 2005. And then in 2014, I applied for a, for a position and I, uh, and I was granted a position and became a, a full faculty, an associate professor, um, um, that's, that's a title, but it's a, it's a permanent faculty number with a, a tenure track professor. And um, so I, my, my own research is um, in terms of um, internationalization, my doctoral degree um, research was on student mobility, what makes students go abroad while others stay. So it was it was a very interesting question that actually, when I think about it, it, it actually came from my practitioner side. We, you know what when when you see stu some students are just not able to go abroad for for you know whatever you do, they, they're not going any any anyhow. So that's what that was my um, doctoral research, and I kept working on the on the issues of student mobility until the pandemic, and then I had to <laughs> switch a little bit of my my research lines. Um, right now, I'm working. I have a project. We're working on a book with um, Hans and Betty Liz on internationalization of the curriculum, uh, best practices from around around the world, and I'm very happy that that we have been able to gather best, best practices from Latin America. We have cases from Brazil, from Peru, from Colombia, from Mexico, of course, um, from Central America, I think we also have a couple. So it's it's very, very nice to bring you know, another perspective from the global south with, with um, I was uh, telling you about early in my, my initial uh, remarks. So um, I, I also, uh, have been very lucky to witness some of the projects of my students and the students are some of them are practitioners some of them aren't but they they are in this track because they want to uh get into the role of um practitioner so they they have very varied um projects research projects but i can mention a couple that are very uh, very interesting and very new and very um innovative in a way uh, one of them is, is a student from the first generation that is not in the dual degree track. She's she's uh, pursuing the the art local uh, degree only, and she's working with virtual reality. And and that was you know she started her project in 2018, so that that was way before the pandemic and all this boom of um, uh, technology get, getting technology into the classroom. So. Um, uh, this particular student is working on how she's she's ready to present her her um, her dissertation, but she's she worked on how the use of virtual reality could enhance internationalization of the curriculum and internationalization at home um, through this um, these experiences of um, um, intercultural communication, intercultural experience, and and so on. So that's that's a very interesting. Um, new avenue that, that she's exploring for internationalization of the curriculum. And another one that I would like to, to um, highlight because, um, because it's pertinent also for, for this moment of time is um, one of our students that has just uh, graduated. He, he, is, um, he was a dual degree student and he worked on how the, to use movies and um, documentaries for developing intercultural and international perspectives for students. So that's that's a, you know another another interesting area for um, developing um, global competences in a in a different way and getting into this this idea of global education for all that we all aim at. Um, so I think that's that's all for me now, and I will um, let the let Gerardo get in. Thank you, Magda. Uh, really, I'm, I'm just noticing already at this point several connections between uh, both uh, your remarks and Bryce's along the lines of some of the questions that were addressed in previous panels about career trajectories, aspirations. So it's really wonderful to have your experiences as well as Giorgio's, um, who will be joining us uh, next. Uh, Giorgio, please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Gerardo. Uh, it's a pleasure for me being here with all of you. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my own experience and also the experience of International Association of Universities, which I'm representing here as the manager for internationalization and higher education. Um, just a little bit uh, before to tell you uh, how I got here. So what is my uh, career path in a way that brought me here working at the International Association of Universities and uh, how I came uh, to work in internationalization and to perform research in internationalization. Uh, myself, academically, I am uh, coming from a completely different field. In fact, I graduated in chemistry. And so I started being a researcher. So the research was already, if you want, in my DNA at the beginning of my, my career life. Uh, but while doing my PhD, I, I also mobility was in, in a way at the beginning of my career because I, I graduated in Milan, my original city, I'm Italian, I, I come from Milan, but then I started my PhD in Amsterdam in the Netherlands and I did one year there and then I came back to, to Milan. And when I came back to Milan, I was kind of uh, <clears throat> looking for the international environment that I could find in, uh, in Amsterdam and in my own city, of course, it was completely different because I, I came back to the city where I used to live with the same friends, with the same uh, people uh, around. So I, I started being a volunteer in, uh, in a local association, which uh, uh, some Europeans, if they are Europeans here uh, listening to me might know, it's called Erasmus Student Network, uh, which is supporting Erasmus students or exchange students uh, during their stay in, uh, in another country. And I did it uh, for pleasure, really, at the beginning. But then I got really involved in this uh, voluntary job, and uh, I grew inside the association until I had the opportunity of becoming the president of the European uh, international branch, which is based in Brussels. Uh, and I spent one year there. And there I start working really on, uh, on the field of international mobility and, uh, and internationalization as a whole. So uh, after a while I decided, but I really like this field of uh, higher education and especially internationalization of higher education. So I will try to switch my career. So instead of uh, pursuing a, a career of, as a researcher in chemistry, I started looking for jobs in uh, um, non-governmental organization in the field of higher education. Uh, and I found uh, and I found a job uh, in, in Brussels in an, uh, in an NGO, uh, an association of university actually, uh, for which I, I worked for five years. And there I was, a, I was a project manager and I was mainly responsible for uh, projects in, uh, uh, together with the European Commission on uh, uh, policies, development and uh, reforms uh, at European level and also in neighboring countries. Uh, again, if there are some Europeans here, they, they should know about uh, Bologna process and uh, Bologna experts and also the higher education reform expert for what was called at that time, the Tempus project. Uh, so after this experience, I, I decided to move from Brussels to Paris, where the International Association of Universities is based. And at that time, the International Association of Universities fortunately had a vacancy, and exactly the vacancy for uh, the position I'm, uh, I'm in at the moment. Uh, and I, I, I went through the selection process, and uh, I was selected, and I became the manager for internationalization uh, back at, in uh, 2015. So now it's already six years that I'm in this position. And I have to say that I really like it. Um, what is the International Association of Universities? For those of you who do, who do not know the International Association of Universities, uh, the International Association of Universities, it's a, a global NGO based at UNESCO in Paris, created by UNESCO in 1950. So this year is celebrating its 70th anniversary. Uh, and it's the most representative uh, association of universities in the world. Uh, because it has members, institutions from all, uh, all over the world, different parts of the world. Uh, but it also has an uh, association of universities, an organization of universities as members. Uh, the International Association of Universities aims to be the global voice of higher education. So that's really the objective of the association as a whole. Uh, and how does it do this, uh, this work and how does it pursue uh, its aims and objective? Uh, it does it working um, with its members and also collaborating with uh, other organizations, as for instance, uh, Boston College is one of the members, but the Center of International Education especially is uh, uh, a very good uh, organization with which we, we work a lot. 
uh, and we do it um, focusing on the most pressing priorities of higher education in the world. Uh, these priorities, which uh, we call strategic priorities for us, are decided every four years during our uh, General Assembly. And for the period 2016-2020, this year is a special year in the sense that due to COVID, we prolonged our uh, period of uh, uh, priorities because we could not have the, our General Assembly. We focus on four strategic priorities. The first one is uh, leadership. The second one is sustainable development. The third one is digitalization of higher education. And the fourth one is internationalization of higher education, a uh, priority of uh, which I am responsible for. What do we aim as International Association of Universities to achieve in internationalization of higher education is to promote a specific vision of internationalization of higher education and a vision which is really shared by a lot of our partners and especially Center for International Education and its former director, Hans De Witt, contributed together with our former Secretary General, Eva Egron Pollack, to write a definition and update the definition of internationalization of Jane Knight uh, in order to put the, um, the vision of internationalization as an, um, an intentional process with an aim, and the aim is to improve the quality of teaching and learning, research and service to society for all students and staff. So really what we aim is to have uh, a fair, ethical and inclusive internationalization of higher education. And how do we do that? We do that through three main uh, actions. The first one is research, and there I will speak a little bit more about that because that's a topic of our uh, discussion today. But we also have advisory service that we provide to our member universities, and we do global advocacy. But I will just focus on the research part. How do we do research? We do research in two ways. Uh, we do in-house research, and for that, our main project is uh, the Global Survey on Internationalization of Higher Education is the only global survey that we perform every four or five years. And we did five editions until now. And I was the responsible person for the last one, the fifth edition. Um, but we also perform research with our partners. And for instance, once again, the Center for International Higher Education is one of our closest partners. And I can mention there different projects that we did together. For instance, we did a project on the importance of uh, uh, languages and uh, language policies and uh, English as a medium of, uh, of instruction. Uh, and now we are involved with, uh, with Gerardo also in a project together with um, uh, the, the, the center at the University of Toronto, the OISE Center, which is a project, three-year project on um, the future of internationalization of higher education. Uh, how do we do? Uh, usually our research projects in-house, like our global surveys, uh, we tend to do uh, mainly quantitative analysis. So we do online surveys, uh, online surveys. Uh, but sometimes we also try to collaborate with, uh, with our organization who are more um, specific in, in, in research or education and try to uh, add some uh, qualitative analysis, so case studies and uh, and good practices from around the world. Uh, and finally, in order to complete, because the time is, is short, uh, just a, a little mention about what changed this year, because of course you can imagine uh, that the work in internationalization was really impacted all over the world uh, because of COVID-19. And as International Association of Universities, we also reacted to this, uh, to this pandemic and uh, we decided to perform some research on the impact of COVID-19 on higher education. Uh, and as I had experience in research and uh, performing global surveys on internationalization of education, I was also together with a colleague of mine responsible for launching this series of global surveys on the impact of COVID-19 on higher education. Uh, and we just completed the, the second global survey, which closed on the 1st of June, and we are now in the process of analyzing uh, this survey. Uh, and we will have a third edition, hopefully, when the pandemic will be over, as we expect and we all hope very soon. I think that's it for this first intervention, so uh, I give back the floor to Gerardo. Thank you so much, uh, Giorgio, uh, Bryce, and Magda. Uh, for uh, for these remarks, I think it's really uh, uh, important and very helpful for all of the participants to see and understand 
your different journeys. I thought uh, there, there were so many uh, interesting pieces of um, information about the work that your respective organizations and institutions conduct, as well as your own journeys uh, through, through this process, developing your uh, different identities as researchers. And it really shows how research means different things depending on the audiences and the purposes. And that's a central message in this Summer Institute. So we have um, the first several questions. Uh, we will try to get to as many of those, uh, if not all of them. But I wanted to start with one that would apply to all of you. And I really think it makes a nice connection with some of the different uh, sessions that we've had throughout the conference by this point. And this is coming from uh, Guan Long Pang. And the question is, uh, as you know, many of the participants in this, um, in this summer institute are uh, graduate students working on doctorates or, or a few of them on masters. A few are recent graduates. So the question is, uh, for those especially graduate students whose work is very research focused, um, how, do you, how do you advise? Uh, uh, opportunities for them to get experience in the administrative or practitioner uh, realm? Um, and also how, do, how can they, um, perhaps if you could compare your own practitioner work with your research work, which I'm sure at times it overlaps. So uh, could we perhaps start with you, Magda? Since you not only have been making those transitions, but you're currently mentoring some of these uh, graduate students. Um, sure, thank you, Gerardo. Well, um, I, I really think that being a practitioner or getting close to the, the practitioner side of, of research, particularly in international higher education, it really enhances the, the research you do because um, it brings a, a different perspective, a perspective more um, insights more than perspectives, I, I should say, um, an insight of what you uh, could work at of the of the research that is needed for the field and and, and to put into practice. And um, I think that one of you know, my, my my advice would be that that uh, you connect with those international officers that are nearby and um, sort of start interviewing them what what's what worries them what what are their concerns who uh who are they they not reaching in terms of faculty members or students and and if they have an idea or a clue of why is that happening and that that really brings you know insights for the research and and gets you know sort of a sort of an avenue to to start um walking around and, and I can say that in, in my case, my, my doctoral research was part of that reflection. You know, I, I, I was thinking what, what elements do drive student mobility in Mexico? Why some students do student, I mean, are mobile and others aren't. And, and that came from my practitioner side and from seeing um, a very, very, very low numbers of student mobility in Mexico in general. So I think it, it really uh, getting close to those people that that actually put into practice the strategies, the internationalization strategies, enriches, you know, the, the, the vision and the ideas of, of what can be done in researching terms, research terms. Bryce or Georgia, would you like to, to add? Uh, Bryce, I see that you unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I can just I can speak from my experience, which is, you know, if 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 the concern is to go from, you know, quote unquote, pure research to kind of more practitioner or applied research, I think there's lots of opportunities to gain that experience. The skills transfer very nicely between the two. Um, and there's there's lots of overlap between the two. Um, and I think it's really just a matter of, of going out and finding that experience. A lot of universities do applied research. Um, so I know we, we tend to think of universities as doing, you know, each professor has their own research agenda and everyone's kind of doing their own thing. But I know when I was a grad student, one of the projects I worked on was with a professor in my, in my program who was doing an evaluation program for an NGO. So it was taking kind of the, the program evaluation plans that NGO had 
developed and, 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 and executing, right? So doing some data analysis on some surveys they had done, doing some qualitative data analysis. So I think there's lots of opportunities, obviously lots of, N, lots of NGOs, nonprofits, um, they, have, they all have lots of research needs. And so many of them are looking for people with quantitative research skills, qualitative research skills, as well as um, you know, knowledge of this field in general. So I think there's lots of ways it can get applied um, to, to various organizations, really no matter where you are in the world. And particularly, I think as the world of work is changing with the pandemic, I think that work can be done really from anywhere in the world in some cases. So whether, you know, regardless of where that that organization or institution is, and regardless of where you are, I think there's still opportunities to do that work. So I think we can all think about, you know, expanding, you know, mentally expanding kind of our geographic focus in terms of where to look for those types of opportunities. Thank you. Giorgio, would you like to add? Please? Yeah, first of all, I want to say that I completely agree with my two colleagues. And uh, another thing I would like to underline uh, the last point made by Bryce, there are a lot of practitioners who need research. And I know a lot of practitioners who are doing research themselves and they are involving in research because really they, knew they need research. So I, uh, I have in my mind a lot of examples of people who are practitioners and then they are pursuing a PhD just because they, in their work there, they encounter research and then they in a way, developers in that field. But it's also true on the other way around, because uh, as the need for research, and especially in organization, in, uh, in NGOs, like the one that I'm representing, you really have a lot of, um, of research you would like to do, but of course you don't have the resources. So if uh, researchers are coming or are getting in contact, they are more than welcome. And this is a, a, a perfect example is uh, the relationship that we have with the Center for International Education, because we have a need for research. Uh, and I, I take a, a really a practical example that we had exactly with uh, CIG. Uh, we had our program of advisory service, which we implemented for many years, but we never evaluated. Why? Because we didn't have the time to do that. But then thanks to the partnership with the Center of International Education, we had a, a student who could develop a research project very hands on on our advisory services. And we created a report, so a research report on the impact of this advisory service. So this is just an example, especially for early research, early, early career researchers, internships, uh, collab short collaboration could really give them an opportunity to work in the field. So experience a bit of uh, even administration in a way, if you want. And on the other end, to the NGO will give the opportunity of conducting some research that would not be able to do it uh, on its own. Thank you very much to, to all three. I think this idea of reaching out, but also listening what are the needs. And, and if I may just take uh, one of the thoughts uh, that, that uh, Bryce, that you shared, sort of this idea that there is no real distinction, right? The, the, in our field of internationalization, all research should have that application. And I think we ask better and more insightful questions. As, as Magda had said, uh, when we are attuned to the needs and the realities of those uh, practitioners. Uh, so I think we have a lot of opportunities here uh, and new opportunities in the future now that a lot of this can be done remotely. If I may, for a moment, we have a couple of questions actually directed uh, to you, Bryce. So if I could combine those two uh, that I'm sure. seeing in the chat. Uh, one of them has to do with whether Wes um, uh, is conducting or has conducted any research about the impact uh, of the pandemic on graduating international students who want to pursue OPT or work in the United States, hmm. and if so, um, whether uh, this would be available, how to get it. So that's the first question uh, coming from uh, Hannah Rapp. Uh, so a question about OPT research, right? The second question uh, also um, for you and, and your work has to do with um, the perceived decline. This is coming from uh, Roger Anderson, uh, the, the decline in second world language or foreign languages. Um, in, in US universities. Uh, have you, like, is this uh, something that has been 
um, kind of uh, showing up in your in any research that Wes is conducting, or that maybe uh, maybe mm -hmm. this question may be of interest for future research. Okay, great. So, in terms of the first question about the impact of the pandemic, we have not done research on graduating international students. So I actually think that's a really great area um, for anybody to take up who can, um, because I think the the impacts of the pandemic are gonna be felt for a long time, uh, particularly in things such as employment of, of graduates. The research we've done has really been really on the front end of higher education, so those coming into it. Um, so we've done some research about international students trying to get into US higher education during the pandemic, which has been challenging. It was kind of compounded by the kind of political environment in the US and, and you know, the visa regulations and that type of thing. Uh, we've also done on, on the Canada side, because most of the people we work with on the Canada side are immigrants. We have looked a little bit also at immigration into Canada and the, the impacts of COVID-19 on that. But I think if anyone wants to take up the, the back end, so to speak, of people graduating out of universities, I think that's a really great area to, to look at. We, in terms of foreign languages in, in US universities, we, we unfortunately have not done really any research in that. I, I know just from, I, I, I just know that, um, there has been a decline of some of those those types of programs, but I, I don't have any research myself to to really add to that, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Very helpful. And it's very important to add that we get to these uh, different questions. Uh, I think the next question uh, coming from Becky Bergman really helps us, invites us all, and I would love uh, uh, um, responses from all three of you uh, if, if you are willing to do that to really look at the future of internationalization in higher education, uh, particularly in relation to whether you think there will be an increase in distance learning, and I would characterize this distance learning for internationalization. There has been a lot of talk about virtual exchanges, oil, and many uh, even remote and international internships and so on, right? So I would put that as a, as a big umbrella term uh, post-pandemic, uh, in you know, in relation, of course, to physical mobility. So I guess what uh, what we're asking you here is to maybe uh, using your contacts, your experiences. Uh, it's really wonderful that all three of you are physically located um, in three different countries, which is uh, also helpful to shape your perspectives. But where do you see this ratio, right, between um, distance uh, experiences and physical mobility going forward. And of course, it doesn't have to be like only one answer. Maybe you can think about how this would change as the recovery also moves at different paces. Um, if we may, uh, could we start with you this time, Georgia? Yes, sure. Uh, so the first question in a way is easy to answer. The second question, we would need a, another event of one hour and maybe would not even be enough. Uh, but let me try to reply to both of them anyway. Uh, do we think about an increase in uh, distance learning for internationalization, as Gerardo said, uh, virtual exchanges and COIL? Yes, definitely. Uh, that will be something that will remain after the pandemic. It's something that... Uh, has developed during the pandemic and uh, university and students realize that is something effective that works. Will that replace completely physical mobility? No. And, uh, and why no? For two main reasons. First of all, because uh, all the virtual internationalization activities like COIL and, uh, and virtual exchanges are not a substitute for physical mobility. They are an add-on. So you can have both. They can allow reaching a percentage of students who would not be able to travel. That's true. So they could be a useful tool to be more inclusive in a way, but they cannot substitute physical mobility for some simple reason. There are uh, some experiences that a student, when goes to another country, has some personal experience living in another country, experiencing the culture, uh, going out and, and buying food, eating, you know, all these kinds of things, really meeting people of a different culture. It, that's not something you can completely replace. This is one reason. And second reason, 
there is no willingness. There is no willingness, neither from the side of higher education institutions, nor from the side of students to completely move to virtual. And we see it even now. We are People are tired of living in a virtual world. People are human beings. They need physical contact. They want to experience the real world. The students want to leave. They want to go to another country. And universities, they want the student in for a lot of different reasons that I will not go into detail here. But th so there is this willingness to, uh, to go on with the physical mobility. The second question is really complicated. And uh, I want only to mention one thing on uh, how do I see the, the future of internationalization of higher education. Um, of course, internationalization, it's it's a broad term. It's, uh, it goes from uh, student and staff mobility to uh, partnership, research, collaboration. But uh, one thing that we are seeing right now, two things we are seeing right now during the pandemic, is that collaboration is increasing, and uh, I hope that this trend will remain post-pandemic, so that we will go back to a world which will have more collaboration and less competition in the higher education sector but competition will not go away, it's easier to stay. But the second one, which is a worrying trend, and I think that is something that us working in higher education really have to think about, uh, is the increase in inequality. And I speak about increasing inequality because inequality was there already. It's not enough, nothing new. We knew that there was inequality, but the pandemic has increased inequality and we see uh, that this can really become a real problem. And we should not have the illusion that technology will reduce in inequality. Actually, te unfortunately, technology alone cannot be the solution for that problem. Actually, it's even bringing more inequality, inequality of access, inequality of quality. And, and this is something that our education institution and all the people working in internationalization should really focus on in the future, in, uh, in my opinion. Thank you, Giorgio. It's so exciting knowing that we will continue working together going forward as we try to answer the second big, big question over the next several years. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Magda, could we go uh, to, to you next and maybe uh, whether you see this uh, ratio between distance and in-person through mobility? Um, well, I, I think that we should be fully aware that um, as, as Giorgio mentioned, there are inequalities and, you know, that, that it really depends on where you're standing, you know, the, the, the place where you're standing. So for, for me a, in Latin America, if I, if I might say, uh, virtual mobility, virtual exchanges in, and uh, COIL and all that is very, very interesting. And it has opened a new door, but it's not a door that everyone is able to open. And, and that and that I agree, I completely agree with Giorgio. We have problems with access to broadband, access to equipment, access to professors pre prepared and willing to engage in, in, in virtual exchanges and COIL and such a, you know, all these um, virtual uh, internationalization that from the offices of internationalization, this make, makes all the sense. But when you try to translate it into the classroom, it's just, you know, a whole, different world with with their own struggles and so that's the first one the first thing I, I want to mention and the second one that I'm uh, I'm afraid that the the low numbers that we have I mean Mexico has a, a mobility um, percentage of one percent less than one percent of, of Mexican students uh, study abroad so that number is is going to drop lower even lower in the in the coming in the coming years for two things. One, uh, basically the, the, the inequalities and the income gap, and uh, which is going to be um, widened. And second one, because of the effects of, of uh, economic problems in the, in the country and in the world. So um, I'm not very positive that we will, you know, it will take a while to recover these low numbers, even for, for, for us to get again to a 1%, which is, you know, one of the lowest, um, percentages in the world. And, um, and, and as, as uh, Giorgio said, um, virtual internationalization can never replace physical internationalization, physical contact. So, you know, the, the risk of losing the, the little thing that we have is 
as not a, a positive, um, you know, a future for for our internationalization in Mexico or in Latin America. And and in terms of the future of internationalization, one one good thing that I that I think that we will keep and we will um, um, very much. Um, um, forget the word, sorry, uh, but, but appreciate, very much appreciate, is having this um, this possibility of keeping, you know, this, this virtual connections and allowing this new avenue that, that many, many, many universities and countries, especially in the global south, have discovered of um, doing things online, you know, of the possibility of doing things online. So that's, that's one positive aspect of it. I think it will stay. Um, Although it's not, you know, it's not the panacea, but but it will stay and it will bring um, interesting opportunities for those who cannot be uh, mobile anyhow. Thank you, Magda. Bryce, is there anything you would like to to add? Yeah, I, I completely agree with both Giorgio and Magda. I, you know, when you pose the question, Gerardo, I, my thought was it's probably going to kind of ebb and flow, and it's going to really just depend. I know that's that's not a particularly satisfactory answer, but um, you know, I, I think as Magda pointed out, as depending on kind of what's happening globally and in, in specific places, the number of students who are able to go abroad will 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 just we see it happen over time. It'll kind of it'll change, right? And and I suppose. I suppose as actual student mobility decreases, you may see an uptick in people who are doing things more virtually, but I think it's just going to kind of depend. But the other thing that I think will, the other thing I think about in all of this is just, it, it kind of depends on how much the universities really invest in doing this. Um, one thing I think about coming from the point of view of Wes is, you know, because a lot of, a, a lot of, international students study abroad for the purposes of employability will the employers accept um, a degree that's done you know completely virtually in another you know there's I think there's just so many different factors and then I think as both Giorgio and Magda talked about there's also the factors of the very practical factors of access to broadband access to um, the right equipment um, I think where there's investments there it, it can work to a certain extent but um, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of inequality in that around the world. So I, th I think it's just really going to depend on how much is really invested in doing it well, if it's going to be um, done at all. But I, I do think that, and one thing I've seen in my own work is that I think, it, I think the virtual connection really is a great complementary, is, is really complementary to the in-person connections you form. So it helps really kind of extend those relationships, extend the collaboration you do. I've started doing more collaboration even with my the colleagues I worked with in Mongolia and the Peace Corps. We've been working on a project together virtually because everyone's kind of gotten used to doing this now. Um, so I, I think that th th there are some positive aspects to it as well. So of course we are quickly running out of time. So what I would propose is why don't I take this last question and we can pose it as, let's say, almost like a closing round and we can go in the order of the program, starting with Bryce, followed by Magda, and then concluding with Giorgio. And I'm just going to take the freedom. Uh, Gian uh, Hernandez has presented this question. I'm just going to slightly rephrase it. And the question is going to be, where do you see a critical dimension in the work that you currently are doing or that you plan to do, right? Because this is a panel on uh, practitioner perspectives for those who conduct research on practice. Where do you see then the uh, critical perspective in the, in the research that you conduct? If we could start with you, Bryce. Um, that's a great question. I, I think that for for uh, for me, uh, one of the things that I think about um, is we when we tend to think about um, international higher education, we tend to think a lot about traditional international students. And one of the areas that we are really looking heavily at um, in West and particularly in my team is those who are not often included in that picture. And and I'm thinking in particular immigrants and refugees. Um, that's where I've started doing a lot of work. So people who have education from other places, they have skill sets from other places, they've arrived in a place like North America or Europe, 
um, but they're having a hard time you know, applying that education and skill set, and they often find themselves back in in higher education, or they're resuming an in, in interrupted education. And I think that that's a, a group of people that we want to think a little bit more about too. I think in the context of international uh, international higher education and internationalization. Thank you, Magda. Thank you, Gerardo. Um, well, in 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 terms of my own research, I think that um, the critical perspective is how to include those who are not present, who are not related, who haven't been able to receive the benefits of internationalization. I mean, not, not even talking about mobility, that's, that's a lot, that's, you know, that's out of the question, but the other elements of internationalization, how can we in, in terms of the University of Guadalajara, train those professionals, train those people that are going to be part of the, of the uh, new generation of practitioners to be aware of that, to take those, uh, those people into consideration. And, and I'm talking about students that work, uh, um, women, um, students from indigenous populations, especially, I think. In, in terms of our university, those will be the, the key population that we should focus on, I think. Thank you, Magda. Giorgio. In, definitely, this is like a, a very important question and a very nice one to, to conclude. And for us, it's always been the main question. Are you being a global association of universities should represent a global view? And, uh, and so include all different ideas and perspective, including the critical ideas. And it's true, internationalization of higher education has been conceptualized mainly in the Western world. So, uh, but now I have to say it was even before the pandemic, there was uh, a lot of criticism and, and, and welcome criticism that we try to include in our, in our research and always giving voice also to, uh, to developing countries, uh, to different parts of the world, also developed part of the world, which might have a different view on internationalization. But what I think was a positive effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's a bit paradoxical because we are speaking about a disruptive pandemic, but has shown the limits of the mainstream internationalization of higher education and has questioned a specific model of internationalization of higher education based mainly on student mobility and on the attraction of international students for economic reasons. Because we see now that the universities that have strongly, they are strongly dependent on that, are those which are suffering the most. So in a way that model has been questioned as it has been questioned the model of internationalization heavily based on uh, competition. So all the things like international ranking, research only to grow in international ranking, etc. And we see that global challenges like COVID-19 cannot be solved only with competition and with national or local initiatives, but we really need cooperation at the global level. So what is the challenge for us in our own research work and our work as a whole is really to try to include all this perspective. And it's more difficult than, uh, than it's easy to say right now because uh, you need to reach out and the, uh, um, the less privileged groups, they have the ideas, they have their own visions, but it's not always so easy to bring them in the discourse and to work together with them. So this is our role as a global association of universities. We try to do it and we have, we have to also be self-critical. We have to do it better uh, also in the future. Thank you to all three of our panelists. Thank you, uh, Bryce, Magda and Giorgio. Your perspectives have been so important and we are so grateful uh, both for your participation uh, in this panel, but also for the sustained collaboration that each of your organizations have with the Center for International Higher Education. Thank you, uh, all three of you. Uh, I, before we 